What's going on guys? So I thought I would give you my thoughts and opinions, a little bit of a review for the newest Roni Kenshin movie, Roni Kenshin The Final, which apparently I guess is not actually the final movie, there's still one more movie to come, but besides all that, if you guys don't know, I am a huge, massive Roni Kenshin fan, it was my favorite manga for the longest time before Berserk came around, and I absolutely adore this series, I grew up with it, it's very close to my heart, I'm a very passionate, hardcore Roni Kenshin fan, and some people have been asking me for my review of this movie or what I thought of it because it came on Netflix not too long ago, and it is, for the most part, really good. I have some mixed feelings, I'm a little bit conflicted as a hardcore fan, but I'll get into that in a moment, but this review, for the most part, is just going to be off the cuff, this is just my kind of thoughts and feelings coming out of my mouth as I say them, this is not written down, so I apologize if this is a little bit less professional than some of my other reviews but I just didn't really have the time to kind of sit down and write a review about it, so I figured I'd just give you my off-the-cuff kind of feelings just off the top of my head. But I appreciate you guys wanting to know my thoughts about it, and uh, thank you for stopping by the channel. If you haven't so far, please consider subscribing because I do a lot of anime, manga, and other style of reviews, so I'd really appreciate it that I also give the video a thumbs up because it will help me in the algorithm. Okay, so Rurouni Kenshin is my second favorite manga of all time. I absolutely adore it. It's one of my favorite stories ever, but I was first a fan of it because of the anime, and as a kid watching the anime, I say a kid, I was probably like 13, 14 years old when I first watched the anime through, and I watched the entire series not really aware that the third season was entirely filler, and that there was a whole final arc of this series that I never even knew about until a couple of years later. Actually, when I got my first job ever, my first paycheck that I ever got, I think I was like 16, 17 years old, the very first thing I bought with my first paycheck was Rona Kenshin Volume 18 of the manga, because this started the final arc of the manga that was never covered in the anime, and was my first chance to experience it, and it's called the Jinshu arc. Jinshu basically is a word that means something along the lines of, if heaven will not cast vengeance upon you, then I'll do it myself, or forcing vengeance upon somebody, uh, a divine sort of vengeance that should have happened, but because it didn't, that means I'll take it into my own hands, taking it into human hands. And this is one of the most powerful arcs of Roni Kenshin because it dives deeply into Kenshin's past. So I'm going to obviously have to spoil a bit of Roni Kenshin for you. So if you want to know nothing about Roni Kenshin, I highly suggest reading the manga. It's going to be the best and most true way to experience the series as a whole. So definitely go check out the manga if you haven't already. I'm going to be spoiling this movie. I'm going to be spoiling a bit of the plot line for the Jinshu arc. So if you want to know nothing, I apologize. But moving forward, I got to talk about spoilers in order to review this movie at all. Anyway, part of the mystery and intrigue of the entire series of Rurouni Kenshin deals with the fact that Kenshin used to be this Hitokiri, this assassin named Batosai the Manslayer, who was famously one of the best assassins that have ever existed, and the assassin that kind of brought forth the new Meiji era of Japan. Without Kenshin's existence, then we might not have had the peace that we had. Obviously, Kenshin is a fictional character, but it's taking place in real historical events, and that's sort of like the storyline, like he was hidden in the shadows, nobody really knew who about him. This sort of dark, fast, skilled assassin warrior that took out all of these very important people that brought forth the new era. So one of the biggest questions of Kenshin, the series, is how did somebody that was a Hitokiri decide to take on a reverse blade sword, give up killing, and become a wanderer? And we get that answer finally within the Jinshu arc of Roni Kenshin. And the Jinshu arc sort of has the theme alongside of it of not only the past coming back to haunt you, but it deals with everything that Kenshin stands for as he decides to kind of take on this role of the wanderer, take on this role of the protector, find that redemption and find that atonement for all of the horrible things that he did, one of which including, here's a giant spoiler, 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 is that he killed his wife Tomoe. And not only that, but before they met each other, he actually killed her fiance as well. So the cross-shaped scar on his left cheek dives deep with each scar has been made by her fiance and by Tomo himself. And it's sort of the representation of because the scar never heals, it's sort of like the deeds of his past, the sins of his past will never go away. They'll always be a part of him. And that the scars are not able to heal because the spirits are obviously not at rest with all of the horrible things that he had done. The Jinshu arc brings in the character of Enishi, which is the younger brother of Tomoe, the girl that Kenshin killed, who made his way over to China after that situation happened, and for the past decade he sort of built himself up in the underground of the black market, and became not only a highly skilled swordsman, but also a prime weapons dealer, even the guy that sold the giant battleship to Makoto Shishio in the previous arc. 
So Enishi returns with the prime directive of trying to make Kenshin suffer as much as possible. Not even kill Kenshin, but just have him suffer. Enact that judgment of the Jinshu. And that's basically sort of the overall story arc of what the Jinshu arc is. Obviously, it's a lot more intricate than that. There's a lot of things involved with it, but that's the overall idea. And as a massive Kenshin fan watching this movie, I was really, really happy to see the Jinshu arc adapted in some way because it never really has been. Now, a piece of it has been adapted in the Samurai X Trust and Betrayal, which tells the backstory of Kenshin, but that's only a piece of the puzzle. It's a 10-volume arc in the manga, and that backstory is maybe three volumes, so you get a little piece of it. And then the anime Samurai X Reflections, which is not adapted from the manga but still has part of the Jinshu arc in there at least the final battle with Enishi but it doesn't have the full arc I, I don't know that's the problem is that the Jinshu arc has been adapted by like little pieces here and there but nobody's adapted the entire thing it's never happened if any anime needs a complete reboot if it needs the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood treatment it is Roroni Kenshin Obviously, there's only so much that you can cram into a two-hour movie for an ongoing story arc, and it cuts a lot out, and I think it cuts a lot of important stuff out, a lot of stuff that I would have wanted to see. Um, in particular, there's a, a moment where Kaoru's death is sort of faked, and then Kenshin goes into isolation. He wraps a chain around his sword. He, vow he basically is like super depressed. He's starving himself. He goes into this forbidden sort of land where all of these misfits have sort of wound up, and he just doesn't want to do anything. The group disbands. Sonosuke goes his own way. Yahiko sort of begins his transition into adulthood. It's a very co coming of age sort of story for Yahiko, which is really great to see of his character, and I love that in the manga, but we don't get any of that in this movie, and I can't really hold it against the movie because, again, you only have two hours to tell the story, and so I understand that they didn't adapt the entire thing. They did they did split the Kyoto arc into two movies, and they might have been able to split this arc into two movies as well, but apparently they have another movie coming out called uh, Rona Kenshin The Beginning, which is going to tell the entire backstory, the whole, like, Batosai becoming the, from, going from the Hitokiri, becoming the Wanderer, like I was mentioning before, which is basically the Samurai X OVA uh, Trust and Betrayal. They're basically going to turn that into a movie, which is fine, which is great, I'm super excited to see it, but again, it's a piece of the puzzle of the entire Jinshu arc, and so so you're making that into an entire movie, but you're not having the entire story of the Jinshu arc told. But at the same time, just being able to see it, being able to see Enishi and being able to see some of his uh, his cohorts here and Kenshin fight them and just the story actually being told in some way through live action form, I, I can't help but just be happy by it. Just by seeing this adapted in some way, it's taken so long and it's never been adapted in any other way and I just, uh, I was just really happy to see it. Basically what it does is it sets the arc up pretty much the exact same way that it goes through in the manga and then it has its sort of battle sequence in the middle and then it sort of skips everything in the middle of the Jinshu arc like I said Kenshin's isolation, the fake death of Kaoru, um, a couple of the other characters like the Gein character which I know you can't really do him in live action because he basically makes puppets of people and then gets inside the puppets and controls them like a mech and it, that would look probably pretty damn stupid in live action. I was actually shocked that they really did the uh, character with the cannon arm in live action because in the manga, that guy is like, you know, three times the size of a normal person. So him attaching a cannon to his arm kind of makes sense in like an anime sort of way. Uh, with a real actual life person, it's kind of hard to make that look convincing. But they did the best they could with it. And I, I thought it actually turned out kind of okay. Obviously, these movies are based on an anime, based on manga, so they are over the top. I would not expect uh, watching these movies and watching these scenes for the characters to obey the laws of physics in any way, shape, or form. But I would say that the Roni Kenshin live-action series, this is the fourth movie in the series, there's going to be five in total. I would say that this is probably the most consistent and best live-action adaptation of any anime that I've ever seen. I think there are some good anime adaptations out there. They're very, very rare. They're very hard to find. But I think the Roni Kenshin ones are a prime example of how to do it. And I think the subject of Kenshin really helps benefit that in that it is sort of grounded in a way. It takes place in a, you know, feudal Japan or a, a hist historical Japan. But we're dealing with human characters fighting with swords. We're not dealing with a lot of crazy power systems or monsters or any sort of, you know, demonic creature or anything outside 
what normal fighting would be. The only thing about Kenshin is that the fighting is exaggerated. Like I said, characters do not obey the laws of physics. They're way stronger than normal characters would be. But for the most part, it's grounded in the sense of that it's sword fighting and it's real humans and you don't have to go too far beyond, you don't have to go too far into the fantastical. Now, a couple of things I was expecting to see in this movie that I didn't is that uh, it, all of Enishi's crew, his kind of group that he gathers to fight against Kenshin, in the manga, they have particular parallels that they sort of fight within Kenshin's group. Uh, Sonosuke fights the guy with the arm guards, and uh, Yahiko fights the one that is like full of trickery, and Saito fights the one that basically looks like Venom. No, really, he just he straight up looks like Venom from Marvel out of the comics. In the movie, however, they sort of shift and change, and Kenshin fights most of them himself, and there is this great group battle at the end of the movie, uh, but I was expecting to see a little bit more of like the one-on-one -on -one from these characters. One thing I like that the movie did that the manga did not do, though, is that brought back Sojiro. Sojiro is one of my favorite characters, and I always wanted him to come back in the manga, and he never does. He comes back in this movie and doesn't really add any benefit to the movie other than just being really cool. But at the same time, I was totally fine with that because I just love seeing Sojiro back. I always wanted to see him come back. He shows up for one moment as if he's going to work for the bad guys and then decides to team up with Kenshin. And it's just it's just a glorious moment to see Kenshin and Sojiro beat the shit out of a bunch of unnamed guards. Oh yeah, by the way, in the manga, Enishi only has his crew of like six people that all work together. In the movie, they give him uh, dozens upon dozens upon dozens of just throwaway bad guys for the characters to fight and discard and I, I i gotta say that it's at least fun to watch all these battle scenes all these fight scenes within these movies you know they're fighting so fast that's another big difference from the manga so like in the manga when a character fight when characters fight each other usually the fight is over within like four or five different moves but the way that the manga draws it is that every move is sort of slowed down it's at this super intensity it's showing you exactly how the physics work even though they're way over the top and so like there's an intensity within these like quick three to four moves but obviously in like live action you want to see characters fight you want to see them fight fast so characters are fighting a lot faster they're clashing swords you know dozens upon dozens of times where in the mangas their swords may clash a couple of times before someone gets a winning blow in the movies they show these fights happening at a rapid rate and it looks great on the screen what can i say i think the choreography is done very very well and it's just fun giving kenshin a lot of fodder to fight through i also do really like the actor that they got to play enishi because the thing about enishi is that he's not just a mustache twirling villain he has some complexity to him and a lot of it deals with his insecurities over what tomo his sister actually felt towards kenshin and being able to blame kenshin for his sister's death because he sees his sister in his mind and she's you know he finds the comfort when she's smiling at him and he thinks that he's doing the right thing and he thinks that he's avenging her and kenshin isn't trying to take enishi down just because you know he's there causing havoc you know kenshin legitimately feels the most guilt that anybody could possibly feel for what he has done and so he's trying to apologize to Enishi but at the same time stop Enishi from tormenting all of the people around him because what Enishi's goal is like I said is not to kill Kenshin it's to make Kenshin suffer so you know he attacks the the restaurant that Kenshin goes to he attacks the police officer that Kenshin is friends with you know he's trying to do all these little things to sort of irritate get under Kenshin's skin and basically make his life an absolute living hell and so it's up to Kenshin to sort of find that uh that common ground of where can I find redemption and give redemption to Anishi but at the same time stop him from doing all these horrible things that he's doing in pursuit of that vengeance and I do think as far as that theme goes, I thought the movie handled it pretty well. Now, there's that huge sequence where Kenshin goes into isolation that is not in the movie, that is far removed, that I think is extra, extra important for Kenshin and how he feels about Tomo and Enishi and everything going on with that. The fact that that wasn't in the movie, it did bring it down a bit for me, but the final confrontation where Kenshin is fighting Enishi, I thought they did a really good job of at least pushing the themes through that and Kenshin saying, because there's always a scene, uh, there's a scene that happens in the manga, that happens in the movie, where Enishi is like, go ahead and kill yourself, Kenshin. Like, if you actually feel bad about it, if you actually want redemption for what you did, just kill yourself in penance so that I don't have to do it, you should do it yourself. And Kenshin's response is, you know, he's able to do a lot more good alive than he is dead. If he remains alive, he's able to push for, if he doesn't reach redemption, he can at least make other people's lives better. You know, he can at least kind of push forward and try to do something with with his life. 
doing the exact opposite of selfishness, which would be to take his own life, would be to kind of like give in to that sorrow and sadness and just end yourself within that sort of self-righteousness. But instead, you know, he pushes forward to try to make other people's lives better, basically spending his whole life in penance for what he did, trying to make the lives around him better. And that's why it's so hard for Kenshin to feel good about himself. It's so hard for him to find a sense of peace or for him to allow himself to believe that he deserves peace, you know? Because you know Kenshin and Kaoru do love each other, but and Kenshin, Kenshin doesn't not get in a relationship with Kaoru because of some sort of anime will-they-won't-they they thing. It's because Kenshin doesn't feel like he deserves happiness in that way. He doesn't feel like he deserves to be in a relationship with somebody because the man killed his wife 10 years ago, you know? So he feels like he deserves that sort of pain, and that's another thing that's so beautiful about it is that Kaoru sort of represents uh, what Tomo was at this point, where she, you know, jumps in front of Kenshin and tries to protect him, and she loves him the same way Tomo did that Anishi didn't understand. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting, like, way off tra track here. I just, I love this series so much, and I think that the end fight scene of this movie between Kenshin and Anishi, I think it does a really, really good job at portraying what the themes are of that redemption and of that vengeance and how they conflict with each other and what Kenshin can do about it moving forward. So I gotta give the movie props. Obviously the creators behind the movie are big fans of the series. Um, it's been the same director for every single movie, which also helps. It helps the movies feel consistent, helps them feel like they're all within the same, um, just that the same feeling, the same tone, the same universe, whatever you wanna call it. So there's a consistency all the way through. And uh, I really appreciate it for what it was. I, I appreciated seeing the Jinshu arc adapted in some way. It's not perfect. It's it's not exactly, you know, what it should be. But at the same time, I think it did a wonderful job with what it was. Uh, yeah, so I thought this was the last movie. And I was going to say my other gripe was that the backstory of Kenshin... Uh, you know, turning from a Hitokiri into a Wanderer and the death of Tomo and everything. That was done in the movie in very quick flashbacks that was done under five minutes, and I was really disappointed by that. But that's before I realized that there's going to be a um, fifth and final movie, that the entire last movie is going to be the backstory. So they're going to do an entire movie with just the backstory, so I'm sure those clips that were in this movie were actually like a teaser for the next movie. So I can kind of understand that and give it a pass now that I know that. Um, but in context, watching the film, it was disappointing because that's it's such a it's such a powerful moment. So you know, but if you want to see the backstory before the next movie comes out, just watch Samurai X: Trust and Betrayal because that's essentially exactly what the final movie is going to be. Anyways, guys, there are my quick thoughts, my quick uh, opinions, I guess, review, if you want to call it. Sorry that this video is sort of scattered and all over the place, that it was off the cuff, just off the top of my head. I probably should have wrote this down to be a little bit more coherent and a little bit. Uh, more structured in this video. I apologize. I just didn't have time to write the review and I figured uh, I would just get it up today for you guys. So I'm sorry if that brought the quality of the video down. I apologize. I promise I'll do better moving forward, but that's uh, that's going to be it for now for my review of Rona Kenshin the final. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's got my seal of approval. I think it's really good. And if you haven't seen any of the Kenshin movies, uh, go back and watch them. Um, I would recommend if you haven't seen Kenshin or anything Kenshin related, I would say just read the manga. Uh, you can check out the 90s anime, uh, just avoid the third season, and or you can watch the live actions, but keep in mind the live actions are pretty much like the Spark Notes version, and they sort of take a lot of liberties, but I do think they are really good in their own right, and as far as anime adaptations go, they're probably the best. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching this video, guys. Really, really do appreciate it. If you enjoyed this review, please give the video a like. Also comment on the video because it does help it be seen in the algorithm. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see some more reviews. And if you want to support the channel on that deeper level, there is a Patreon and merch store down in the description below, along with all my other social media links. So thanks a lot for watching, guys, and I'll talk to you next time.